All right, there we go. So today we are going to talk about cinematic conventions in VR. Do you want to use this or uh, one of the? Are you guys hearing me all right? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, people all right. Uh, TV Land. TV. Oh, I see. Hey, TV Land. There's more than all of these strange faces looking at me right now. That's unnerving. So we're going to talk about cinematic conventions and virtual reality, which is kind of dry. So I've subtitled it. God damn it, Timmy, pay attention. All right, look at that. It's beautiful. Again, gorgeous, giant. Look at that. The composition, hey, the composition, and it, it's amazing. But now we're in VR. There's no more frame. There's no, like, genius cinematographer to help guide the eye. In fact, now you've got a new person on your crew. You've got a new camera operator. I'd like to introduce you to him. His name is Timmy. He is a 12-year-old spastic. He's got ADHD. He's on a sugar high right now. But we're going to teach him. We're going to get Timmy to be a really good camera operator um, using some examples that we're going to go over right now based on uh, The Last Mountain, which is the film we're working on. So let's take a look at The Last Mountain real quick. This is just one scene from the larger film. Oh, where's my sound? Poor little guy. Okay, so one of the things people have been talking about, I mean, this is a very nascent field. Um, how does editing work? Does it work like in movies? Short answer, yes. Yes, it does. You can have hard cuts. It works just fine. Cool, so we can use that. Um, Time compression and expansion, just another standard editing technique. Does that work in here? Yes. You saw a little bit of it. We kind of uh, ellipse over little chunks of time. So another answered question. And this is where it starts to get a little bit more tricky, where virtual reality is a little bit different from the film world. If we're watching this and we motivate the user to look off axis, and then we cut, we need to make sure that whatever we want the user to see is going to be positioned over here and then we'll probably want to bring their head back into alignment somehow, just as a comfort issue. So that's a little caveat for editing. You've got to be aware of where they're looking when you're about to cut. OK, directing the eye within the shot. So we just talked about editing, where you can kind of reset everything if you like. Now we're talking about within a shot, how do we keep Timmy focused? How do we keep him from wandering off somewhere? Moving the camera. But wait, you say. Avram, this is virtual reality. You can't move the camera. Everybody's going to barf, you know. Their heads will explode. Western civilization will come to an end. Eh, well, you know, I mean, people get nauseous going on boats, but we've still got sailors. And there's a real big difference from a giant cruise ship and being on a dinghy in the middle of a hurricane. So there's a smart way and a not-so-smart way to move your camera. Dollying in and dollying out, moving the camera just like this, in on something or away from it, works very well. There's no real nausea tax here. That's helpful. Uh, and keep in mind, anytime we move the camera, if there's something motivating that move, some kind of on-screen motion, 
really makes it a much more pleasant experience. So dolly in and out, we're good. Tracking, or for you gamers, that's strafing. Um, works pretty well, not as well as the dollying in and out. You get a little bit more of a nausea tax for this one. Uh, crane shots, your vertical movement, up and down. Again, not so bad. Oh, <laughs> um, Right, pans and tilts. All right, here's where we start to get in trouble. The forced rotation on the viewer. Uh, if you're telling the viewer to look one way and their head's trying to go the other way, that's not so good. So, what can we do to ease this? Well, first of all, you can make it very slow. You want to make these pans, forced pans and tilts, gradual. The other thing we can do is what we call, uh, we're calling it a nudge. We want to just kind of be like, hey, little Timmy, we get you started going in one direction, and the user will finish the look based off of that first nudge. Other techniques. So what we were just looking at, moving the camera, that's like grabbing Timmy, you know, we're jerking him around, slapping him, be like, hey, look over there. Uh, well, these are going to be our more gentle techniques. Motion. Now, if I were to walk over here, well, I mean, what do you do? You, I mean, you're not still looking over there where I used to be. You're looking at me over here now. This is a big one. This is a great way to get people to look where you want. And this is on-screen action, essentially. So, motion. Social. Now, um, if I were to point out, Renee, if you guys want to look over here, I tell you, I, I look over here, a crowd of people look somewhere else, I point. All of these social cues are pretty good at getting people to look in a particular place. We use it in the first shot of our film when Rocky, that's our little rock guy, he looks off into the distance, and what we're hoping is that the viewer will look as well. Dramatic tension. All right, so hold on one second. I'm just going to have a sip of water real quick. Um, now, dramatic tension is just a, a basic storytelling device where we get kind of interested about something that's going on on the screen. So, dramatic tension, it, it's a powerful tool. It's more powerful than sound and motion because I'm over here right now and I'm making noise. But what are we worried about? We're worried about this, right? It's a perfectly still bottle of water. It's not even it's very quiet but it's very interesting. So dramatic tension, great way to keep people focused. <laughs> sound, I mean, duh. yeah, sound works. Uh, what I would say is interesting, it works maybe even better than you might think. Um, so please do make use of it. Panorama, so up to this point, we've been talking about where do we want Timmy to look? We want him to look at something in particular. Well, what if we don't want him to look at something in particular? We want him to look around. We want him to take in this big, beautiful vista we've created. Think about the opening of No Country for Old Men. It's Tommy Lee Jones talking to you, and it's just all these gorgeous West Texas vistas, and you kind of just take it in. So what do you do there? You just don't give him something in particular to focus on. Make use of it. It's a nice way to slow down your narrative. Um, I guess uh, Timmy's going to be OK. We're going to be OK. There's a lot of stuff we can borrow from cinema, uh, and that's going to help us tell some really good stories. Uh, and these are the people involved in this particular story, and I want to give them a shout out. We've got um, Handsome Mike, we've got Paul Kanyuk, he's, where is, he's here somewhere, he's a good guy, JP, Selena and Renee, Carol, Thomas, Ben, Chris, all these, all these awesome guys, Francis, Manny, Bagon, Andrew, Turner, Douglas, Ryan, George, those are our people. And so, big shout out to all you guys. And uh, that's all we've got. Thanks so much for listening, guys. I hope, I hope you like The Last Mountain. All right, great job, Avram. Uh, we've got time for a couple of quick questions. Uh, you, sir. Thank you. Um, so one of the things in VR is a lot of times you'll have everything in focus, and that feels kind of weird. Mm. I'm thinking, uh, what do you think about depth of field or field of view? Yeah, if we can control depth of field, field of view, that'd be another great tool. Uh, the question is, I mean, how do you do that at this point? You know, there's not really the mechanism for it. But once that becomes an available option, yeah, go for it. And I would say that, like, uh, for some of these things, if you wanted to blur out the background stuff, it'd be a great way to, one of the ways, another way that I didn't list in here, that's a way to get people to focus on a, a particular thing is to limit the depth. Throwing the background out of focus is going to bring your focus to the foreground or whatever is in focus, whether it's foreground or background. Uh, so it is a tool. The problem is 
if the user tries to look at the other stuff and it's just like rendered as out of focus, that doesn't work so great. Next question in the back. Yeah, have you uh, thought about how to restructure your stories in uh, virtual reality? How do you mean? Uh, well, right, a traditional story is narrative. You have a single hero, you know, you have a, you have a, a single line in that story, you know, but when you enter a VR space, especially interactive, that story, it seems like it's not, it seems to me, it's not appropriate to transport that story structure into this new space. Oh, uh, well, appropriate. I mean, there's the story that I'm trying to tell, which in this case is very much like the cinematic experience, and we recognize it doesn't take advantage of all the programmatic things you can do in virtual reality. But you're absolutely right that that's an exciting new area, and in fact, the people we've got coming up are doing just that. Um, but it's not the only way to tell a story, right? It's like we have these options in VR, but we don't have to use all of those options for every story. But it's a great question. Uh, next question. We've got time for two more questions. Oh, taciturn. Oh, oh, there we go. How, what is your experience been with using traditional techniques like hard cuts and crossfading, things like that? In my experience, it's always been very... Um, jarring the minute it happens. How do you kind of see yourself kind of getting past that or helping alleviate some of those concerns with like hard cuts and things like that? Yeah, that's a good question. I've thought about this a little bit myself because, you know, in regular cinema you can have a dodgy cut too, and that's disorienting. And I was thinking to myself, when we have a cut that's not working, why is it not working? Is it because it's inherent to virtual reality that a hard cut can't work? And I don't think so. I think a lot of how you make a cut work in this world is by giving people a geographic anchor. And in our film, we're using our main character as kind of an anchor because we've got a big open space that doesn't have sort of flagpoles laid out. But if you give people something that orients them immediately in space across the cut, then you should be fine. And I think um, our film does that pretty well. And um, uh, some of the other projects that are going on here also do that very well. And you'll see when you watch it that, oh, OK, there's a cut that works. All right, one more question. I'll let you pick it, Auburn. Uh, I'm just curious how many actual 12 year olds with ADHD have you tested these concepts? <laughs> uh, just, just myself. I'm the emotionally, <laughs> that's who I am. But no, it's an interesting question. One of the, uh, just the other night, we were running this past, and people never had put on a riff before, weren't 12 years old, but didn't have, they had no idea what they were diving into. And didn't know if they could look around or not look around. And once they were, they would look around for, and this is, this is I want to bring it back to the sound thing real quick. They were looking all over the place, just getting that first moment in virtual reality. And then when our little lizard friend chirps, their head just snapped to it. So yeah, I mean, some of the techniques are more effective than others, but they do work. All right, give it up for Auburn Dodson. All right.